we did anticipate that there will be neurological complications right from the very beginning. Now, I've been studying viruses since the 80s when the AIDS pandemic started, and it was the same story there too. A lot of people have long-term cognitive problems, even if their virus is well under control. What affects the brain can be extremely devastating because it can affect your personality, your ability to think and concentrate, your mood, and those things that make us a person as a whole. When SARS-CoV-2 emerged, many were initially focused on its impact to the lungs. It soon became apparent that COVID takes a toll on the entire body, from the gastrointestinal tract to the brain. Autopsies have revealed devastating damage in the brains of those who have died from COVID. The blood vessels were damaged, there were inflammatory cells around the brain. We found that there were immune cells in the brain itself. And we found antibodies stuck to the blood vessels. So we knew that they were attacking the blood vessels. I had expected that we would see a lot of virus in the brain because the virus affects the nose. To our surprise, we didn't find the virus in the brain. There are few people they have reported detection of virus in the brain, but they find very, very small amounts. And it doesn't explain the pathology that we see. Most of these autopsies were conducted on individuals who had severe cases of COVID. Less is known about brain damage in those with long COVID, symptoms that persist for weeks after what is often a mild stage of acute infection. Studies estimate that up to 30% of people develop long COVID after an initial SARS-CoV-2 infection, and that women are at greater risk than men. The symptoms can include fast heart rate, shortness of breath, and various neurological issues. We've actually seen over time, now that we've seen hundreds of patients and lots of people have been reported in the literature too, there are these kind of major categories. One of them is this, what people call brain fog, where really your brain is just not functioning properly for some sort of cognitive types of tasks, things like concentration, memory, People have skin changes where they basically say, well, the sensation on the surface of my skin is really abnormal. And then another major category that we've seen is headache. There is the sort of psychiatric categories where people have rarely had a much more acute and profound sort of delusion or psychosis syndrome. I think it's been a real challenge for patients that they come into the doctor with symptoms and the tests that are run are negative. And even things like MRI, which is a very sensitive test that can find lots of changes in the brain, for many of these patients is, is normal. For a long time, we've been using research tools that can look at more sensitive measures that aren't things that we necessarily um, use in the clinic, but can tell us things like whether the immune system is functioning completely normally or whether there might be very subtle injury to the neurons in the brain that you just can't see by looking at an MRI scan. There are three hypotheses that can potentially explain how long COVID can affect the brain. One is a direct infection of the virus of some cells in the nervous system or supportive structures in the brain. Second hypothesis is that there is autoimmune responses that are attacking parts of the brain. That could obviously trigger lots of different symptoms and long duration of uh, such responses because once the autoimmune cells are activated, it's very hard to deactivate them. The third possibility is that there is distal inflammation happening, such as in the lung, that could stimulate cells within the brain and trigger a long-term changes in those cells. So a combination of these could be happening, or it could be a sequential event of things that happens, and they all contribute to this uh, brain um, neurologic issues. Long COVID clinics across the world are trying different rehabilitation approaches to improve these symptoms. Our nervous system has um, a whole portion of it that is dedicated toward doing all of the things that your body needs to autonomously control. When that gets knocked out of balance. That's called dysautonomia. Dysautonomia has also been reported in other cases of post-viral illness. Autonomic rehabilitation is a very personalized and a very delicate approach to rehabilitating the autonomic nervous system. For most people that we see with long COVID, it typically begins with very, very gentle movements paired with breath work with a patient laying flat on their back, slowly performing movements that 
increase blood flow into the chest cavity. It's not exercise, it's not aerobic, it's, it's very gentle. We've had good response to cognitive symptoms from autonomic rehabilitation. I think it's worth mentioning that not all cognitive symptoms are from dysautonomia. And so in some cases, we don't move the cognitive symptoms at all. Researchers are also beginning to conceive of drug treatments that may address the underlying causes of long COVID. A team at the National Institutes of Health is awaiting regulatory approval for an immune modulating drug trial. Plan is to bring in patients. We're going to keep them in the hospital for a week. And we, one arm will get placebo. The other arm will get uh, intravenous immunoglobulin. And the third arm will get uh, intravenous corticosteroids. They are sledgehammer approaches. They don't, they're not very precise attacks, right? They affect the immune system in many different ways. Vaccination in long COVID patients have impact on their symptoms. Some people feel much better from vaccination. That could eliminate the source of these persistent virus or viral remnants or you know, something that's basically um, uh, persisting in these patients that's triggering the chronic inflammation. Number two, some people don't feel any difference uh, at all, but there are some people who feel worse from vaccination. If a person is suffering from autoimmune disease, for example, um, the vaccine-induced inflammation might you know, exacerbate the um, autoreactive lymphocytes and, and therefore making the disease uh, temporarily worse. And the ultimate goal is to try to understand what we can do to help them feel better without using the vaccine, because vaccine doesn't work on everybody. But if we can figure out what triggers the better improvement in their symptoms, then we can try to emulate that with other therapies. Many hope that the knowledge gained from long COVID research will benefit others grappling with post-viral illnesses. We have millions of people suffering from not only this, but very similar related diseases, post-Lyme syndrome, Gulf War syndrome, MEC. Patients, they're going from physician to physician. Nobody knows what's wrong with them. People tell them, well, it's all psychological or anything, but they have real disease. Now we have a superb opportunity to put the best tools that we have available to us, try and sort this out. If we could do that, I think it'd have a huge impact in the field.